Welcome to Eve 2020. It is Monday, July 13th. I am Matt Arall here with a few friends. We'll talk about Eve Online for the next few minutes. All right, instead of going through our usual, um, let's just open up a topic and, uh, and get going since we don't have that much time today. Why don't you guys actually say hello so that people know who you are? Uh, Caleb. Hello. McLeod. Hey, hey. Spod. Strategy. And Arya. Hello, good morning. Okay. I, uh, I believe one of us is a spy. <laughs> yeah. At least, <laughs> <I'm only taking. laughs> at least one. Uh, but let's... Um, Let's actually talk real quick about what's going on uh, in the war. Do a quick war update if there's uh, any information you guys have. If not, you can go to yesterday's show where we talked to Grath, Laz, uh, Headliner, about the war effort with Elise Randolph as well. Uh, and... Uh, take a look at uh, the state of the war there. And also we had a Saturday show with uh, Killa B, kind of breaking down what was going on uh, as, far as, as far as movements go. Uh, I will say, and I've said this a few times now, just to give you guys themes for every week of the war, uh, it is going to be a long war, probably. It's uh, just beginning, so it's the first week. Nothing major has happened uh, Forces are still getting aligned in the... Let's see if you can see my mouse. I do not think you can. So inside of Catch... Let's go to the universe map, actually. This will help you conceptualize. So there's all of EVE Online, and... Well, you can't see the mouse, but... Uh, down here in Catch is where the attacks are essentially coming from. Uh, the system is fat. Do I really fat tax uh, 6P? Which is way down here on, on the border of Aquarius. That's where there are two keep stars. And that's the Southern Theater in the North. Uh, the attacks are, let's actually take a look at this on the map. I didn't realize there was much going off in the north. I thought oh, all yeah. the fighting was down south. Well, depends on what you call the north. It's west, basically. All right, here's the catch area. You're looking at it there. And it goes... Uh, it goes into Aquarius, or actually Canid there, but uh, lower catch down here will go into Aquarius. Um, but where the attacks are coming from is down here in um, Stain, and even Esoteria, I think, is, or Paragon Soul, these two areas down here at the bottom right. So they're moving into lower, we'll call it lower delve, like Baja delve as period basis, and um, test has been making attacks on there. That's in the south. So the the real crux of the war will happen in Delve here if it gets to that point. Uh, Aquarius is not very well defended. We were talking yesterday about what is a floodplain and what is considered like the city. And up here in the north, the attacks are coming from this little area here called Hophib. Well, I can't zoom in. Yeah, that's probably going to be a fairly significant event occurring prime EU time zone uh, today. EU time zone, that's, that's soon. Yeah, it's uh, within the next uh, two hours or so. What's going to happen? Uh, there's a bunch of IHOP timers coming out. Uh, and there's obviously a few structure timers coming out. Yeah. Um, Obviously, uh, Initiative and Imperium want to defend that, so we'll see what we'll see. Yeah, so 
what, what you have basically is two theaters. One is the Northern Theater, we'll call it, and that's in Fountain. It's coming, the attacks are coming from Meridia. That's where people have piled in. Uh, they're looking to break down initiative in, felt, in Fountain. That's the goal there. In the South, you have um, former ally of Imperium, Legacy, attacking from all along the southern border down here. And they're moving into, not directly into Delve, but right into period basis and maybe Aquarius. Uh, they're attacking from Stain or Catch or Esoteria or Paragon Soul. So that's where those attacks are coming from. It looks like um, the FCs that we talked to yesterday say that the attacks in Fountain are the ones that are more consequential right now. Uh, but it does look like there's some progress that uh, they have made uh, breaking into period basis. Now, on the one hand, the Imperium says, well, we can give up Fountain, we can give up period basis. It doesn't really matter. Aquarius, we don't even care about Aquarius. We've never colonized it, for instance. On the other hand, the period basis is almost like getting on the continent. It's, uh, it gives you a place to stage and attack uh, more ferociously into Delve when, when that time comes, if it comes. And same with Fountain. Fountain goes directly into Delve. And so uh, there's also an NPC region here that people can stage out of, but that is not what the invaders have decided to use. Instead, that might be a part of a plan later on since they're not, they're not really going right after Delve right now. They're trying, what they're trying to do is close in on Delve, and that's what's, uh, what's up there. So the first week was basically a lot of staging, a lot of people arriving to the south down here in legacy space, and a lot of people arriving to uh, Aridia uh, to get set up for these attacks. They continue to arrive even now. In the meantime, Imperium is doing logistic um, control by trying to break supply lines to these guys that are invading by blowing up every freighter in Jida, basically. <laughs> Right, Spod? Didn't you get a piece of that? Spod. Did he go AFK? Why does he not listen to me when I talk about this stuff? All right, anyway, Spod is a jump, had a jump freighter get blown up. Uh, it was in uh, Jita, I think. Actually, I think he's at work. Test. Aha. My, no, my, uh, my, my push to talk button broke. <laughs> Did you get uh, a freighter knocked off? I did, and it had nothing to do with the war at all, unfortunately. At least that would be an excuse uh, as to why it died. Why'd they shoot you then? I mean, who shot you and where was it? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> okay. <I'm> sorry. <laughs> I went into an invasion system. Oh, oh, you were killed by rats. Yeah, I realized... Uh, uh, well, I didn't realize that scramming triglavians that sit on gates are a thing. I know that now. Um, it was an <laughs> expensive lesson. Oh, uh, I, here I thought that you were attacked coming out of Jita, like they were blowing up all the freighters coming out of Jita, and you were one of them. Oh, no, I was, I was going around Jita specifically for that reason, really. Oh, you were trying to get around Jita because freighters were getting destroyed. Well, I was, I was trying to uh, stage to move into the north uh, because my freighter used to be in the south. So I I carefully planned and had all the cover and assistance I needed. Um, mm -hmm. I just didn't expect to get surprise scrammed by NPCs. Okay, so it has nothing to do with the war then, probably. Nope. Okay. Well, a, a but, little bit, uh, right? It's, well, it sort of does. Oh? Well, you, you, you didn't want to go the direct route, so you did the detour death. Yeah. Well, it, ironically, it was the actual destination system that I jumped into that happened to be the invasion system. So after a long night of jumping, I thought, aha, I'm here. What's that little scrambly thing underneath my capacitor? Uh-oh. How is the uh, resource attrition camping going in there uh, and around you to pop up? I don't know, to be honest. I've not been affected by it yet. Well, you were talking about, I think they were talking about it yesterday that uh, quite a lot of uh, freighters were getting blown up and that uh, in general, at least the Imperium is uh, targeting freighters, not just in high sec, but pretty much everywhere. It does seem to be that people are trying to put a stranglehold on all the things. Like, was it Munins have been sold out constantly for a while and people are really having quite a field day with that market. 
it's going to, I suspect that the, this war might actually uh, uh, get us to the effects of scarcity, right? The, the whole thing that Rattati and, uh, and his friends have been introducing um, might actually end up being felt in the game. Um, but ironically, as I think someone mentioned, I'm not sure if it was on the Meta Show or if it was on TIS, uh, that everyone is, feels comfortable about their wealth. But I suspect that they mean their ISK. And since the ISK mm. faucets have not been touched in any meaningful way by the scarcity uh, changes, then you might be ISK nominally wealthy, but when the prices start changing, you're not. Yeah, I've been listening to some of the big producers and um, it sounds like their uh, stockpiles that were rumored for years, which do exist, um, are running out a lot quicker than everyone expected. Yeah, that's usually the case, right? People underestimate uh, the the actual depletion of, uh, of, of stockpiles and war chests. And I'm, I'm just curious to see if, well, first of all, the, the morale thing that uh, some people have already started uh, whining about um, the war and then, of course, the actual cost in resources, because I don't think you, there is enough stored to just keep feeding this war machine. Maybe in, in Delve, because we've seen Delve really grinding resources for the past two years or something like that, maybe more. Um, and everyone else has been storing ISK, and ISK is useless in, in, in a war like this. It, it's completely hmm. worthless. Well, it's I've heard of a few people. Uh, I've heard of a few people, people talking about uh, stockpiles in the range of seven to eight hundred billion. Um, but then, in the same breath, they they quote, "That's only going to last like four or five big battles, if that. Might likely less. Like that stuff just gets." eaten up insanely quick well kenneth kenneth Vald said uh in yesterday's show he's an industrialist and he's for a pandemic legion who are one of the groups attacking that he made uh 800 or so um minmatar hacks um munins <clears throat> and uh 800 if if i think about it you know that might be four to eight fleets which is not a lot for a long a long long war um, but that might that might work for two weeks or so. So we'll see. That's just what he's produced so far. Well, this is where, this is the numbers I'm kind of hoping that will will be available at some point to see the, the the cumulative effect of the current battles. Right? How much have actually been destroyed? Because if we, we want to give any estimate of how long this war can actually go on we need those numbers and we need to get uh, real on guessing how much is actually stored in in real resources, real ships and materials to actually uh, replenish the, those ships. Because as I said, ISK is worthless and it, it won't make any ships appear out of thin air because that's not how the system works. Right. Now, who do you think will be able to to have the better supply situation then well i don't know who's been stocking up what i do know that when it comes to actual just raw materials i know that fortress delve is massively overstocked with uh materials of course they've been feeding so, some back to to Heisig and, and to the rest of the universe but as i've said a few years back it feels like a lot of of eve is actually fed by call it the, the, the almost slave-like crab labor in, in Dell, right? It, it's pretty much been the massive uh, mining um, income does it, uh, or creation. This is what I'm not sure on, because I think it's different for every group out there. Where, does, where do the minerals go? Do they just sell them right back to the state, to the Imperium? Or do they keep it for themselves or try to sell it somewhere somewhere else for a, a bit more like where well, you're talking about exports right how much yeah. have actually actually been exported out right. of fortress right. delve and i think i would say at least a third of the of the wealth created um on a month on month uh, basis have been exported and converted into some sort of uh, isk wealth but that still leaves a lot of materials 
in the hands of the Imperium. And I'm just not sure that, well, they could basically uh, just do a fortification thing where they just sit tight and wait for everyone else to start getting hungry. Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't the Imperium have, and this might actually be true for everybody, I'm not an expert on this, but they, I heard rumours that their problem lies in that they have got tons and tons of materials, but they're all in private individuals' hands. While those private individuals might be part of Imperium, uh, getting them all to muster the right thing at the right time is a bit of a task. I think You're asking how much the state actually has access to? Yeah, like what's the ratio of individuals to state holding these these stockpiles, which are going to be needed, but... You know, if you, if you don't have the keys to them as a state, that's becoming a problem. Of course, this is a complete guess, but I would say it's a third, a third, and a third, right? So a third has been exported, a third has been converted and is still on individuals' hands, and a third is actually somehow available to uh, the actual state, so to uh, organizations, corporations, and alliances. Yeah, so Rancor uh, reminds us that we're all guessing, and that is true, but we're also experienced players over many years uh, about the EVE economy. And we're also looking at uh, past behavior. Uh, we're looking at the rise of the Imperium, which we watched happen. We talked to Aerith twice, three times. We uh, have been paying attention for the entire growth rate, growth uh, life cycle of Delve. So it's not a complete guess. We're not just saying like, this is what I feel um, because for whatever reason, it's, uh, it's a little bit of observing the game. So yes, we're guessing because there is no way to know. The state doesn't tell us how much they have. People won't admit how much they have. And all around the board, everybody's behavior is a bit different on this. Well, the actual state doesn't even know they would also need to guess, right? Because they don't, they, they might have a lot better uh, insight in, 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 in numbers uh, because they can look at what they have available, but they still will have to guess on how much uh, has been stored up elsewhere and doesn't, how much has actually slipped through the hands. And, and Well, into, doesn't the mining ledger mind. fix that though? Doesn't the mining ledger allow you to... You, you can't control that. It's just, uh, there's just too much information that you would have to trace down. I, I don't know if they actually have systems to, to get good measurements of that. I, I do know that uh, the Goon Cabal is uh, pretty good at, at, at crunching numbers, but I, I don't think that uh, they can see what everyone is doing and how much they are giving back to the organizations and how much is actually being almost siphoned out of, uh, out of Fortress Stealth. Well, I, I do think that a lot has slipped out and also because you want to convert things into, into actual raw ISK so you yeah. have the purchasing power. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of distinction to make between like the individual and the state, and I don't know how important that really is. Well, I think it's more important to know who is active and who isn't. It, and yeah. the important thing with people coming back to the war is the people who are inactive who may have supplies of minerals or ships, modules. They come active, their, their stockpiles become active again as well. And in an empire-building climate, people work together. It's not that you know the state and the people are separate concepts and they don't talk and they're completely independent. I mean, it, it just doesn't work that way. People are yeah. work together for war, whether you're an FC, whether you're scouting, people are coming out and working together as part of the war effort and that includes industrialism. And that's how it should be. Every member of your alliance in a war scenario comes out and does their part. And, and what you're also referring to is what can be discerned from the MER as the ISK Delta. But the ISK Delta is raw ISK, right? So when people resubscribe to EVE and you see a bump in the in the activist Delta, um, that is only the part of their wallet with raw ISK. It doesn't show actual NAV. Ideally, we would have a number that also shows that on the MER, but I don't think uh, CCP wants to actually add that because most people that re-subscribe uh, an account will be at least, I think, 90% would be actual raw material uh, wealth and not ISK because it's people locking on with, uh, say, their Titan accounts and uh, they might not have a single fucking ISK in their wallet, but they do have the Titan, right?
Well, I, you know, I, your point's taken, Aria, that it's a moot point because... I think with the with the private state thing, Aria, that, that was what I was getting at in terms of, like, the people that have the right things you need may not necessarily be active right now. There. I'm unmuted. Um, it's a moot point, uh, Aria said, and it's point well taken, that uh, pretty much if you're in the Imperium territory, that if you have supplies, and this is a war, that if you're a loyal member, you'll you'll use those resources for the, for the cause. Um, I think that goes without saying, except there are some people who might have sold off over time before the war happened, um, stuff that they had mined. And uh, I think Nick pointed out, and I want to say thanks for that, that the mining ledgers are on a corporate level. Uh, so it is a hassle to collect all those corp ledgers, put them together and try to figure out how much mining is going on. If anybody could do it, it'd probably be Imperium because uh, they like doing that kind of number crunching. I think they are very proud of the fact that they have metrics. Uh, that only so. gives you the moons, right? It's less of a hassle than you think. Yeah, um, that's true. 99% of the time, you have everybody in your corp signed up to some kind of auth site, and then you can pull their own individual uh, mining ledgers, which includes belts and oms, everything. Oh, so you can get... So you that's can... something you volunteer for, right? Yes, but what major alliance these days doesn't demand yeah. you hand over the keys to your life at the door you're made to volunteer if you want to join only pandemic horde does not require esis and if you but they do require it if you want any sort of position with any trust they rejected my application the bastards <laughs> <laughs> wait what i don't know why but yeah yeah, you have to give away your. It's because you lost a freighter to our rats. That's why. I care. All right, so that's the situation. Imperium, they have um, an industrial base that's been going strong for like three years. So what's the opposite? Uh, what's the situation for these disparate groups that are attacking? I think you hinted at it, didn't you? Uh, I think you were mentioning that they're not as poor as some might think. But as I was hinting at uh, earlier, I think they're isk rich. I don't. I think a lot of those groups are fundamentally uh, carrying a lot of uh, non-warfare mm, wealth. Um, of course, they do have uh, things like their, their their titans and dreads and all that stuff. But it, again, it, it's about can they replenish uh, when they lose it. Well, we're also assuming yeah, that's the big that. difference with the small groups. A lot of small groups, that's how they source their ships. They have ISK from a variety of sources. They go to Jita and they buy ships. So if there's no ships in Jita, what do they do? And some of these other groups, even PL, Kenneth, Kenneth gave us some great insight on PL. He he supplies those ships. So when PL needs 800 munins, he sources it and gets it done. And, and a lot of times that means building. And that's the difference between some of these groups that have and have an industrial core, and then some groups who are just pure PvP and rely on the Gita market. So, <clears throat> oh, carry on. Have we killed Narrow? So Duncan mentioned that. Materials are are not hard to get right now, and industry people are Thanks. building just fine, and that's important to note. That would suggest we are not feeling the effects of extreme shortage. Well, you don't need to have extreme shortage. You just need to have uh, shortages in important items, right? This is about uh, punching holes in, uh, in in resources where you you basically target one of two things and then you make that a massive bottleneck and just what, what people call manipulate it. And it, it's about how dependent are Null on uh, sourcing things from the hubs. I would suspect that they do have uh, some nice stock, but hi historically they, they've been sourcing a lot of this stuff from HiSec, um, basically swapping back and forth uh, with other entities as uh, with the markets. So it's really, when is it going to start hurting and when are you going to start seeing the the, the, the pressure from the scarcity? Um, we already have seen some of the moon materials have been manipulated uh, massively. 
and I think as as uh, Dita tries to resupply, because well, we know that that high is pretty much keep playing and almost ignoring the fact that there's a big war. What is that going to mean to the actual price and valuation of things? And that will also change the value of the stockpiles in null. And this isn't a Dell thing. I mean, this is every group in null second pass <clears throat> space has an industrial backbone, or at least most of them do. So this isn't Imperium only, Brave. They have a, they have space, Test has space, um, PanFam has, has fit space. Everyone has industrial engines running in their empires. Even in Dell, a lot more stuff gets imported than they'd like you to think, though. It does, and and that's been almost admitted many times when uh, null entities have uh, complained about stock uh, availability in high sec. So your proof is pretty much in those comments, right? And that goes back to the whole like, if I mine something, it's free. I mean, everyone looks at the price. If, if it's going to be cheaper to buy an import, people will go that route. If it's yeah. the only way to get a, something, you will buy an import. I was looking at a tip that what was that. Oh, I won't say. Somebody said Farragal was gone. I just looked, and, and I don't know if this is updated correctly, but it looks like there's a lot of Farragal. It's at 40000 now, but what's the price supposed to be, I think is the real question. I would go I would go with what Caleb said. It doesn't matter what the price is supposed to be because ISK is yeah. so plentiful, it almost doesn't matter. As long as it's available, I think that there's there's no bottleneck, right? Because you can always find money for it, I think. Well, the, the, the thing is about the price finding point, right? Because what are people willing to mm, sell it for, right? And I think many of the prices of, of a lot of these things, raw material-wise, can actually go up by many, many percents, right? I think the, the the moon materials could easily go up and triple across the board, right? There's a few things that have been overproduced, so, so they're pretty much massively stockpiled, right? But mm, some of the, the, the special things like ferrogel and um, the, uh, what are they called, the special ones, the uh, the terahertz and, and, and whatnot. Transistors. Uh, all, of those, the... all of those things, right, they basically is strained right now they won't be exported during a war at least not in a meaningful way so we are on the stockpile of high sec until it starts getting replenished and it will not reach a peacetime price point uh until after the war uh, so i would say that they could all double and triple especially if it's a long war right if if this is over in two weeks sure nothing's going to happen and we're not going to feel any of the effects of scarcity because it's going to go right back to overproduction uh because i don't think the scarcity that has been introduced by ccp is actually effective and meaningful enough it, it's it's a it's a step in the right direction but it's still definitely not something that can resolve the effects of infinite spawning anomalies raw quills and infinite building slots so we've been living with that for almost five years so we won't hit the the things that Matati want until post a big war and when the actual design starts being a pressure point as i as i've said it needs to hurt and i hope that uh, the ctp will bring more of that <clears throat> all right i'm just looking at the prices here We'll get Dunk on if he wants to jump on. It's up to him. <clears throat> um, well, what we can report in the news anyway is that um, the Munins are hard to find and they've gone up in price. Let's look, look, look at those prices. I don't know if that's going to play a big role. People do like Munins. They're fast. They're effective at range. But in a, in a war like this, I'm not sure that that's that's a game that's a breaker after the first couple of weeks it'll be ferox fleets grinding against ferox fleets for months on end <laughs> yeah that's what happened in high sec right why do you think it would go down from hacks to uh ferox 
because people need to be able to sustain their grinding through ships, and that's your cheap workhorse ship for a fleets. Not not everything has to be a hack fleet. So, and when you need the workhorse ship, that's going to be a Ferox fleet. Yeah, well, if we have a look at Munin's five day trend line, yeah, it's definitely let's turn off min max. It's definitely shot up, um, but it looks like it's stabilized at three hundred fifty. Well, let's see if there's actually sales. Yeah, the, I would yeah. think the Ferox uses more tritanium and, and minerals like that than a. Tech to hack. Yeah, but that's T1 materials, which are plentiful everywhere ish. They don't have that complex supply, react, etc. chain. The Shores and Nelsec removed the Tech 1, though. It did, um, but I wouldn't say to the point where people are really struggling. We also have to remember that a lot of things when it comes to industry is actually being sold below production cost because of the whole, if I build it myself, it's free. And that's really the point that I'm hoping to see very soon shift. So there's actually a profit margin on everything based on actual sourcing uh, of materials um, from Gita. So, so, so this is many of the graphs that uh, you're looking at, if you, if you notice, they are extremely flat. It's almost like it's price fixing, right? Um, and that is supposed to end. That's supposed to flip. The if I build it is free thing is terrifyingly prevalent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's because and, and, and it's especially true if you're in, in a situation where you're basically just trying to convert resources into raw isk um, and not really care about the price or the hourly work that you've put in, right? Um, but when we get scarcity, and especially if we also start getting scarcity in this uh, replenishment, then that will change and, and, and it will become a meaningful market again, like it kind of used to be, where you could actually do warfare with, with markets and, and you could actually uh, speculate uh, long term and you could really uh, make some, some nice uh, profit and some interesting play just by following conflicts and geopolitics. But um, I think Dunk Dinkle out in the audience said this before, the scarcity isn't really a factor right now. He's also just mentioning that there, there is one like data cores, right? And, and you are seeing data cores starting to move too. So uh, what, this is one of the things that, uh, uh, how much of that is going to be replenished while the war is running because people don't really have the same time or focus on crabbing. So how much stockpile of that is around? I don't really know. Mm, yeah, data core has been trending up. Let's see if we could find other data cores. Aren't data cores passively generated, though? No, no, yes, no. no. Well, n not in a meaningful way. Um, I think maybe only about 10% comes from passive uh, generation. Pretty sure the rest comes from uh, active play. They used to be completely uh, passive from research agents. They used to be from research agents. Yeah, they changed that to faction war, right? Yeah. Yeah, which was a little bit of a well. I think it was. A bit I, lo of a I lost track of. The, yeah. Well, this one's going up. What's this one? The plasma physics. Plasma physics is, uh, I used to know this stuff, but I forgot. It's either Galente stuff or um, it might actually be cloaky stuff. I think it might be in both. I know it's in Galente. Yeah. So that's gone up. Um, and, and there's a few that have gone up. Some have stayed flat, but all data cores have gone up year to date. Oh, that's a three-month cycle we're looking at. Let's look at year to date. Yeah, quite a bit. But this has been happening for since June, right? Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting spot. Well, anyway, I don't see, like, you were just talking about Munins, right? That's the big one. And they've gone up 100 million, but um, that's not out of reach for some of these guys. And it, look, it looks like it's stabilized in the last month. Um, sorry, in the last few days. 
it's starting to fall into the price point. So people stop buying it at 300 and what, 350 million. So it's starting to come down. And if we look at what's on this market, there's 100 here at 340, basically. Those that go fast if they're needed. Um, these are all about 100 million each over the usual, which is not nothing. That's not nothing, but there's, there's definitely a lot of money in these groups. And also, I don't think they're burning through munins right now. And let's look at Ferox, because again, Ferox, I think, is with, I think that's true. I think Ferox is a cruiser that will be used. It's a shield cruiser. Battle cruiser. Sorry, battle cruiser. Thank you. I knew it was a bit bigger. Um, yeah, those prices are going up, but those are nothing. Those are, you know, it's a, the usual might have been like 40 million, and now they're up at 60. Uh, these things, these things really just rely on materials. Sorry, minerals. So their base cost. There's no complexity to it. There's very few bottlenecks because every mineral, minerals are in everything. Uh, so those are going up in price, but there's no bottleneck on that kind of thing. So I'm kind of with Dunk. I don't know if there will be massive shortages, at least in the first few months of this war. Could be wrong. I think that's a fair point someone just made there. Uh, scimitars is probably more likely what you want to look at because those are the things that die more often than the munins, but they go hand in hand with them. Yeah, I think uh, tiger... scimitars and hugans. Yeah. yeah, there's a whole chain of different items. <coughs> <clears throat> you too, add to spod. That just breathed in funny. <laughs> I did the same thing. Uh, Let's look at the five day only. Turn on the dosh, turn off dosh, and uh, let's turn off min max, turn off, yeah. And that. And we'll see a bigger trend line. Again, this is the five day, so this is the fast moving one. Uh, and you can see it's still being pulled up, so this, these scimitars will go higher and higher. Um, the scimitars are a big deal, and I think the reason they're, uh, the Imperium says they're putting the brakes on Minmitar stuff is because those scimitars are critical to shield fleets uh, and that's what test uses quite a bit our uh, test uh, they, they like the shield stuff uh, so we'll see yeah so they're moving at like 300 when before they were at like 200 that's a, that's a lot for them that's like one third their price uh, Dunk Dinkle says uh, and he is an industrialist for brave uh, the industry headache now is managing the number of alts needed to do reactions and build the T2 components, spreadsheets, and uh, JE assets. To know what you're building to keep ship module production smooth. And that is a man hour tax, which I like, because that's, that's how you really limit EVE Online, is you make people have to spend hours doing a thing, and that dissuades... Um, uh, some groups, so it's not an issue of money, it's not an issue of, of uh, paying for ISK, it's not an issue of any of that stuff, it's how much, how dedicated your guys are and how much actual work they will do on sp spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff. And this is the thing that I would have flipped on its head if uh, I was asked to do the redesign of Industry and Eve. I don't think alts should be the solutions. Uh, I think the infinity should be on the actual character sheet that you should be able to build as in as many slots as you want on one character. The management uh, problem should be in space and saleable. So the limiting factor should be slots on actual structures. So Dunk would have the same problem, but just flipped and he wouldn't have to log in 10 accounts or 15 accounts to manage his stuff. He would instead have yeah. to manage 15 structures to do the same thing, but just with one character. Yeah, I think the pricing going up is normal. I would expect prices to go up in a war for ships that are popularly used. I would see the stocks in GDA would be deplenished, uh, depleted a bit um, for those ships that are heavily used. What Caleb was mentioning, though, would have such a massive effect to all participants in a war. If, if there was no longer infinite slots in a structure and a structure was capped at a certain number of slots, that would affect everyone's production. Um, and it could even fit, affect to a point where it severely impacts the war. 
So um, I, I've been on the same side as Caleb about that change, thinking that's a, that's a good change that would come to Eve. But I would also say it's not a good change to come now to Eve. No, 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 no. If it came now, it was it would be a tragedy and and horrible because it would completely mess up everything and people would rage like crazy. But on the other side of a war like this, this is exactly the discussion and the type of change that we really should have because then a war effort would also become a lot more strategic because you could basically say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to target their uh, raw material sources. I'm going to target their, their production abilities. All of these things would become strategic again. This is also why I'm a fan of the idea of actually showing when Titans are being built, because I do think that we need the uh, disruption of uh, Titan production uh, back in the game. So a lot of good comments here. Um... Let's go, go back here. Casual uh, GS says, Ferox and Osprey fleets uh, ink all day long, all T1, almost impossible to manipulate. And that uh, points out we're saying if it's only minerals that you need to build your ship, it's, it's hard to bottleneck those minerals. There's just too many sources. So T1 is... Not immune, but it's uh, it's harder to corner any kind of T1 market. When you get into T2, it gets a lot easier. There's a lot more rare bits that go into the ship. And if you capture one of those rare bits and buy out the market, now you can manipulate that price. So that's a risk of uh, using a lot of Tech 2 ships. Uh, so these wars will probably grind through a lot of T1 just to keep it safe. And I think one that's of the things... That's also not true. It's also not true, Merrill, because okay. he, he's right in the fact that you can't manipulate it because you can't uh, corner the market or uh, or do the whole uh, uh, monopolization or manipulation of, of titanium or uh, mineral prices in general. But what it does, it, it, it all ties back to the actual current labor and the stockpiles of those resources, right? So they will start depleting, especially when when the, they're being fed at, at a massive scale. And the people that are currently in war are not crabbing the same way that they used to. So the price will be affected. And that means that the bottleneck will come from actual lack of labor. People are not mining enough. <clears throat> well, there's a lot of people not in this war um, that are laboring. Yeah, 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 but they, they will only be able to uh, restock some uh, parts of the mineral market, right? They won't be uh, able to easily restock uh, the high-end stuff, which is why uh, you're going to see that starting to take a hit first, and the rest is really about logistics, so that will start being visible later. Yeah, the I question think is... you're already seeing it on Sidereen, right? How much later? Well, let's look at uh, Sidereen. I think it's already started spiking, and and I'm I'm suspecting that it's going to be in that order. Mega side is like most likely completely overstocked because uh, of the whole uh, bling effect that everyone is chasing the high end stuff. Um, but Sidereen and um, Mexalon is okay. going to go back to be uh, the the limiting factor like it used to be. My experience uh, my is suspicion, you, you don't need a lot of Sidereen. Uh, it's usually the least the least quantity you need to build. Um, it's gone up a bit. I mean, we're looking at the three month. Let's look at the one month and then turn off this Doshin. Yeah, it's it's gone up a bit. I mean, it definitely looks like it's hit. I don't think that's a cornering of the market, though. Uh, let's look at the other ones, too. Pyrite. This is a really broad based. It's actually gone down in price. It's uh, it, but it was overinflated for years. Um, there's way too much pyrite in the world. There you go. What's this? Well, Not, uh, let's just yeah. agree to 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 comment that the fact that Mexilon and Sidereen has doubled in price over the past year, right? Yeah, but look at I mean, compare that to this. Uh, you can see the actual effect of the war on Nox, which is a traditional bottleneck. This and Mexilon. And, well, um, no, no, Nox is, is, is spiking, uh, of course, right? Uh, but again, these are the, the mid-rangey uh, minerals, and they are usually the ones being affected most by, by the destruction numbers. I'm, I'm just pointing out that yeah. when it comes to the effects of scarcity and the new normal, you are seeing a doubling of price on, on uh, Sidereen, and you're seeing a doubling on price on Mexilon. And that is considerable, and you should 
suspect that Noxium is going to do something similar. So it, it will most likely go back in the five six hundred okay. uh, is range. You're right. I was looking too closely, but if I if I pull out to it one year, uh, yeah. clearly the prices have been going up on this, uh, and that's what you're saying is scarcity. This is not necessarily due to the war, but this is due to. Um, there we go. You can see even a better in there. Yeah, and they, they will just end up being as important as they used to be, I suspect. Mm -hmm. um, at least if, if what CCP is fixed uh, is is properly fixed, um, and then they will become massively strategic because they will make the the volatility of the pricing of the mentioned T1 hole uh, stuff that you talked about earlier very very important, right? Because that will also change the entire ISK efficiency stuff when there's actual battles. Because what are you actually fielding? Are you fielding something that is very, very heavy in, in, in T1? Or are you uh, fielding something that's very heavy in T2? So what is it going to impact the most? Do you feel like this will drive new players into mining or corporations that yeah. recruit new players will drive them into mining? Because now the prices of, of the ore and the minerals are going up. Ships are also getting more expensive. So any, any new activity where a player might lose a ship is now more of a uh, something they they want to avoid. And it's just going to say, "Welcome to the game. Welcome to Eve Online. Have a venture and, and mine." Well, I think I think every every lower uh, tier uh, activity is going to go back to being meaningful. Um, I think mining is definitely one of them. And uh, of course, I'm dreaming. But if we also see some sort of fix to the raw pool uh, at 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 a future date. Um, this might be even more relevant, right? We, we're basically bringing back the value of what we would call the, the grunt work, the, the, the leg work, and, and taking it out of the hands of people um, that do like what, um, what Dunk is talking about, using alts to just scale everything uh, vertically, right? So having 15 accounts uh, doing industry or 15 accounts doing mining fundamentally has broken the game, I think, um, because it has diminished the value of actual real uh, live players. Hmm. Well, I guess we'll have to see. I mean, this is the long term. It's a long term thing. And most of the time, you really only know what happened after the fact and you look back on it uh, but our predictions are that uh, uh scarcity scarcity will slowly take effect be accelerated by the war although uh, dunk dinkle who's again he's an actual builder in brave and was a csm member says that scarcity doesn't seem to have the uh, the pre-war, the scarcity effect was fading, the prices were dropped, even super caps were, prices were falling. The ore changes don't appear to have the intended effect. I think that's an important point there. Well, just to, to reply to people saying that I'm silly for saying that the 15 accounts as an alt accounts are still uh, a benefit for CCP's wallet. Yeah, that may be true, but my, my claim is that those 15 accounts as alts because of the way that the game works now, has basically made uh, 30 or 45 or even more unemployed. Uh, yeah, so what you're saying is one person that can do the job of 15 means that 14 players don't play. Well, I'm, I'm saying that that is actually more. I'm saying for each scaled alt, right? And because the people that do these things are massively professional, right? They really crunch numbers. And for each account that Dunk adds to his industry alt army, it basically follows and makes two to three real players unemployed. And this is the type of players that I want back. These are, uh, are the people that, that actively play the game, and it is not just one guy with an army of bolts. So Pyrvass, I'm confused about supplies coming to the war front. What happens if we are prepared and ready? So the attackers are at the war front, but they still have space back home where those industry uh, engines are still running. There are people mining moons still. There are still builders and building in their structures. And then those ships can get moved to the front lines to replace lost ships. And actually, since uh, 
ships uh, take up a lot of space in a jump freighter compared to compressed ore, what we'll eventually be seeing is people setting up uh, production facilities on the front lines so they can refine ore on the front lines and then turn them into that into ships. And that's when I expect to start seeing a lot more Ferox fleets since Ferox's aren't really uh, cost effective to as cost effective to tr transport via jump freighter as a hex. But once pr frontline production gets going, we'll see more of that. In your home space, you don't even need jump freighters. You can just use regular freighters and shoot them from system to system with Titans. Yeah, look at this. Uh, look at this. Look at this. I sound like uh, Triumph the uh, the uh, comic dog. But look at this. Um, <clears throat> that's a nice incline for uh, Maxilon, which, again, is used a lot over the last year. So something's at if work. If I'm not there. mistaken, it's because it's heavy in the high, uh, in the big uh, hulls, right? It's always been very uh, much out of balance when it comes to um, what you actually need to build uh, things like dreads and, and all that stuff. Um, all the super uh, hulls are very heavy on, on Maxillon. And uh, that's usually why when there's a war, we know that the thing that's going to really start spiking is something like Maxillon because re replenishing the stock of uh, supers and titans is usually uh, really hitting the, the Maxillon market because you pretty much, they come in there with, the people that need those things are not that, uh, don't pay that much attention to whether or not something is like 10, 15% more expensive, but if it hits specifically in one uh, type of mineral, um, that's really what makes it spike. Yeah, Mexilon and Noxium. Here's Noxium. You can see when the scarcity changes were announced, there was a huge run on the market. Um, price Prices shot up, but people kept buying. This is around February 11th. Um, it was at, what, 262 moving average, and it jumped up to about 450. It's a massive jump, but the quantity is... See if I can zero in. the quantity there is, you know, the average quantity is like 50 million, was like almost uh, 275 million. So it's a big, big buy up of uh, Knox when scarcity was, or, you know, mineral changes were announced. And you can see it's kind of come down since then because the hype usually does that. Um, if it's overhyped, the price goes too high and then there's a slow decline. But once the war started, it looks like it started going back up again. These are base one minerals, basically. This is the... Mm. And it goes back to the whole core of why EVE is so great, right? Because everything in this game is in one way or another made from titanium and made from base minerals. You can't make anything without that. That means everything ties back to actual activities of someone mining in space. And this is the, the, the reason why why labor cost and, and hourly productivity is going to be meaningful, especially if CCP has hit the right point in scarcity and we're bringing back the real game. Hmm, okay, so we've determined there's certain things that are expensive and shooting up, but they seem to be stabilizing. Could be wrong about that. Um, we have to we have to take into account the whole stocking thing and, and the fact that yeah. people are not that willing to, to change pricing. Um, so they almost naturally try to fix it at a certain point. What do you mean by that? Well, if if they if they are mentally used to uh, a Ferox being at a certain price range even though, it, as I said, building it uh, from actual purchases of materials currently on the markets, they will still tend to hold it at a fixed price instead of actually taking it up to the new uh, real cost. This is uh, 
a little bit weird uh, when it comes to to eve players and it's back to the whole if i build it myself it's free or if i mine it myself it's free uh people don't value their time and the actual price finding mm. this is the second time i've seen this question caleb are you a trader and eve <laughs> I, I haven't done much else for the last five to ten years i wouldn't call you a day trader though uh, we have friends no, no, day no, traders. No. So I describe you as more of an economist type in that you look at multiple different areas over a long period of time. Yeah, I, I, I manage the, the, some of the social groups for, for the actual market and uh, uh, money inclined people, which also, of course, includes uh, a lot of uh, industrialists on scale. There's just a difference between uh, null industry and what would be considered high seg industry. Right. Oh, I don't know if uh, Caleb is super mega rich. I don't think he is, but um, you do run groups that are finance oriented. So basically think tanks that talk about the economy. Uh, My friends are richer than I am these days. Let's, let's, let's say it like that. <laughs> right. And everything from skill farming to, to everything that makes ISK in this game, right? Like you, you run into all those types. Yeah, I... To be, uh, just to disclose, I did lose my trillionaire status recently because of my own fuck-ups, but yeah, I'm, I'm not that wealthy anymore. Hmm. You're no longer a trillionaire. Popper. Gambled away on Hypernet and lost. <laughs> yeah. No, I did stupid shenanigans and, and, and tried to, to, to chase a, a dream, and uh, it uh, failed fairly miserably. Creator. I, I caught uh, uh, a lot on uh, a mutual fund that I started, so uh, that kind of gave me a few hits because I was burning my own disk. Yeah, well, as long as it's ISK, right? You could have done that in real life and have been a problem. But um, So that's where that knowledge comes from. And also you've been playing since 2003, and I think you were involved in the industry way back then. So. Oh, yeah. We, I was experience. part of the, the guys that started to uh, production empire and uh, finance the whole big blue thing. Um, where where Fozzy actually used to uh, have a, a, a bit of a, a play in uh, in that whole shenanigan and, and the big failure in, in moving into null. Ancient history, and uh, I had to go on an eve break because of wife aggros, but uh, that's, uh, that's old history. Wasn't there, there used to be like, Doing a little bit of history here, there used to be shipyards that were known for building. Yeah, there was uh, like locations that were known for for massive production, and again, it's tied back to the whole slot issue. Uh, I think it's one of your backyards, if I'm not mistaken, uh, wasn't it? Wasala um, in Galenta Space that was a massive ship production hub because it has so many stations and so many slots. You mean, which one, gel, or which one are you talking about? No, no, no. Uh, I think it was Ursulet. Um, oh, Ursulet, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, was. I think that's the one with, mm, I, it was 20 or something stations, Yeah. which means a massive amount of slots, um, and people would be using that whole trick of uh, plugging slots with uh, something useless uh, until they actually needed it for production. But yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's, that's one of the locations. This is back to how these hubs are created. They're usually based on something that CCP has designed into the game. They are not humans doing it by choice or emergent behavior. This would be something that we could get if we got structures to be the dominant thing and NPC stuff to be completely nerfed to the ground. Yeah, Earth Alert uh, was a long time ago was the trade hub for Galante before Dodixi, right? Dodixi came up because a lot of... It was the production hub, right? Production yeah. and research hub. Um, not necessarily the trade hub. Yeah, it wasn't the, but a lot of stuff got traded there because the people were building there. And yeah. uh, you can see there's a ton of stations, a lot of them research facilities, a lot of building facilities. So that system is where I lived for a long time. Um, but it was, it's just kind of, I, I always consider it like the Acapulco, <laughs> the place that was really cool in the 70s and 80s, but you don't go there anymore uh, when you're on vacation. What is it with you and, and beach property, right? Baja and Acapulco, what, what's next? Are we all, all going to be sipping long drinks? There's something about cliff diving and Acapulco and how big that was in the 70s, 80s. 
Um, you just want drinks with small pink umbrellas. <laughs> And people started chasing each other around with machetes in the streets, and uh, the reputation went to the tank. Cocaine killed everything. Uh, so nobody goes there anymore. But in this case, Orcelot doesn't work anymore because you have other priorities, other ways of making money. And the whole industrial thing seems to have kind of sagged, right? Yeah, they... pretty much. And, and, and this is back to, to the whole issue with the problem back then was the fact that slots were plugged, so you couldn't really participate. And to fix that issue, they brought in things like queues uh, initially, where then you could get a slot eventually as it cleared up, right? Mm, which was a good solution. Uh, it was just not the optimal one. And the optimal one was the, the thing that the players asked for, the ability to actually rent out POS slots, right? Uh, so you could uh, make money from actually investing in infrastructure. And that was supposed to come with structures, and it kind of did. But then they also added infinite slots. And it's like, then you're back at square one. Now the actual structure is worthless because if there's infinite slots, you just need one to supply the entire universe. Yeah. So that bottleneck's broken open, which means more people can participate, which means more people with alts can participate, which means that there's just a ton of um, competition and it brings everything down. Um, well, in the yes. past, stations in NullSec, you could um, rent out slots too. Mm -hmm. But you're always limited because one station per system. Um, and a lot of times you didn't want industry stations in every system. And now that we're in a the structure mechanic, you got multiple structures in the system. So that old mechanic would actually apply with the current structures. It would be amazing. If, if we got something like queuing back and then limited slots. So you had a capacity bottleneck on structures. And then we got an NPC uh, structure building uh, completely nerfed. Ideally, so they could only do T1. Um, that would just massively change uh, the strategy of the game and make it something that it was supposed to be way back in, in the early days. It would really make the game uh, much more vibrant and much more uh, volatile mm. and chaotic. We, we talked about this. To... Sorry, go ahead, Arya. I was going to have to ask, though. Wouldn't the workaround just be drop more structures? Well, yeah, of course. But uh, when you're dropping those structures, now they are a strategic asset in space that can be destroyed. You can't destroy an NPC station, right? And and then you would have things like price wars. You would have all the effects that you saw with the Plex stuff in high sec trading. You would just see it on a massively bigger scale, right? Yeah, I'm thinking about having, you know, we have a certain amount of structure spam in some systems. I'm thinking what would 10, 20, 30 times the number of structures look like in a system well, just to get the, slots back? Well, the, the, the slot uh, balance would be the important point, as I also argued with Kenneth, right, because he was making kind of the same argument. But if you, if you get to a point where you say that it's 25, 50, and 100 slots for respectively uh, medium, large, and extra large, that's enough pipeline to support most things. The whole thing needs to go back to being balanced on the number of active slots needs to then be uh, reflected in the fuel consumption, right? So you, you would have to get something like a limiting factor on that. So you can also disrupt fuel uh, uh, um, generation um, for, for people's uh, actual structure, uh, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, all of these things need to be tied together. And I think that's what Ritati is seeing and paying attention to because that would just make everything more meaningful and he wouldn't have to do that much work on actually fixing um the the availability of of resources nodes wise he would basically have to, he could lean back and then just let player activity and player labor uh create all the content that we are missing all right the finger says here um, what's the big industry change that happened a couple months ago that you guys are talking about? I think he's talking about the scarcity move. And it's not just one change. There's multiple changes. Uh, I think they changed um, mineral outputs from asteroids twice or three times. They took it away. They took certain minerals away. They made them scarce um, in certain parts of space. They took them away from... Uh, some atoms. From, uh, yeah, but they also took took it away from wormhole space. Uh, so if you were moon mining, you didn't also get normal minerals. The idea, though, in general, is uh, that there is a movement at CCP to create more scarcity. They're very open about this. So 
what they're trying to do is make it more difficult to get minerals, which will make the mineral price eventually go up. And, uh, which in turn will attract more miners, so you'll get more people working the fields, but the field yields will be smaller. Uh, it's and, also to add uh, the whole granularity of the different phases of production in EVE, right? Because if you do something like this, it benefits, uh, the, call it the, the, the new players more, because they will have access to actually take part in that part of the game, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It becomes meaningful, right? You can be a miner and actually make some money, and that's good. Right. But the, uh, the other thing is, there's a few things they're going to do. One is they're going to make uh, minerals give less. Sorry, asteroids give less minerals. They did that. They're going to make them scarcer, so harder to find. They've done that. The next thing they haven't done is the third thing, and this is the final thing, and that is to make it a dynamic system. So we don't know what that looks like yet. We might find out tomorrow when we talk to CCP a little more information on that. Maybe not. Um, but uh, tomorrow at this time, we're going to be talking with uh, CCP Rise. And uh, I have a whole list here. It's about five devs are coming on, talk about the next quadrant, basically the next three months of development. So come around tomorrow around this time at uh, 1600. Okay, but those are the three things they're going to do, right? They're going to make less minerals. They're going to make them rarer uh, to find. And then they're going to make... Uh, make it a dynamic system, which means they might appear in one place and disappear in another, and that kind of will constantly change, so people have to move around to get them. Who knows what that looks like? So all those mean mineral quantities will be harder to find and therefore more scarce. So j Dog asks, do you think minerals need to be worth more or the items themselves? A lot of the items are built with minerals, so as the cost of those materials go up, so will the item and vice versa. I mean, there's other factors involved, but typically that's what you're looking at. If a if you're looking to buy a battleship and a battleship costs twice as much, you might think, wow, it's going to take that much longer to make that disc. But if you make risk mining, the minerals cost twice as much to make a battleship. The price is the same. Theoretically, you're making twice as much per hour mining. It should be a wash. And that's the thing, as mineral prices go up, yes, ships will be more expensive, but those mining professions is per hour also go up as well. Yeah, the, the real challenge, in my opinion, is to make sure that it is the real players and not alt accounts uh, sourcing these things. So it's not alt accounts uh, basically massively mining. It's not alt accounts doing industry. It's not alt accounts doing markets. All of these uh, infinities needs to be flipped right and and turn it upside down so so that it benefits the actual real player and n not necessarily just some top organization this is about a trickle down economic uh change something that makes labor valuable again um by the way somebody said they're not a miner so they may not benefit i suppose is the the problem uh it turns out in eve online the way to make the most amount of money is called value added service, right? So that means the people who are taking minerals, creating something and selling those in the right marketplace are the ones that make the most amount of money in EVE Online. That's a fact given to us by CCP. So if you're not a miner, there's still going to be a benefit for you because the mineral prices will be higher. You can build that into your product cost uh, everybody is expecting prices to go up on items so they will adjust and continue to buy and the margins will be better for the builders so and then there's on top of the builders there's the miner who, who harvests there's the builder who takes the harvest and creates something you know one tier up two tier three tier four tier up doesn't matter but those are the builders and then there's the person who who sees opportunity in trading so they'll take the item that has been mined built and uh buy it at a low price and then possibly sell it at a higher price in the same market or move it to a different market where there's a demand so all along that line there's opportunity for money to be made which means that a lot of the non 
uh, traditional in the last, f- I don't know, seven years, right? It's been kind of a, you know, shoot things, make money, use your money to buy cheap ships and shoot things. And it's a cycle. You just, um, you NPC rat so that you can PVP. And that's been a, a huge theme of EVE Online for the last eight years, nine years. But before that, there was much more of a diversity of things to do in EVE Online. You could be a builder. You could be a trader. You could be a hauler. Um, there was some there was some money in exploration. Uh, and that's when wormholes came out and it was supposed to be like big money in exploration, but more danger. That was the whole idea of wormholes. Um, when they first came out, you weren't supposed to live there. You're supposed to expedition in mine things, uh, do some ratting, come out with rare loot. They could build T3 ships, which were new at the time. So the, the idea was there was an ecology. And so this, what this CCP is doing true. is getting back to that. And, and this would have stayed true if uh, CCP didn't make the mistake of actually also making it a money printing thing, right? Because they also added uh, money printing into wormholes, they pretty much devalued all the special items that are sourced there, right? So again, this is usually when, when these things break, it's because CCP has historically not, well, they've had awesome well, ideas. Don't you get you gotta wrong. explain the yourself. Game is, is massively Caleb, good. What is, what is money printing in wormhole space? Uh, blue loot, right? The fact that, mm-hmm. that, that when, when you live in, in, in wormhole space, you, one of the things you get is um, an item that you can then export and then convert directly and instantly into ISK, right? Um, the point is that if, if the, the, the majority of the, the production of wealth in wormholes is from blue loot, right? then it undermines the value of the actual risk that you've put up uh, to the source material that is unique to the wormhole, right? So everything that's based on T3 uh, is currently, I would say, at a third of the value that it should be if they remove something like blue loot, because you should not be printing ISK in the wormhole. You should be sourcing very special materials that you then export, just like you said, almost expedition wise and then sell back because it has a massive benefit uh, technology wise in a certain area. And this is again back to the balancing of different types of ships should have more of a specific purpose and a specific benefit. And ideally T3 should be mostly beneficial in wormholes and then have some added benefits in doctrines. This is where I disagree a little bit with you. I think blue loot is a better mechanic than ISK bounties because it is of course but that, that's, it's being generated. The that's not a bounty. counter. That's not a counter. You, we're not talking about the same thing. Right. We're not talking about but, a universal printing of ISK. We're talking about a generation in a geographic location. Yeah, so I like blue loot better than ISK bounties because at least it's an interdiction. If, if everything was ISK yeah, bounties, everything should, everything should be blue loot. Well, let, let Ari get the his fact point that out. You can, the fact that you can move it means you can be attacked. In the Triglavians, they did something similar. I guess it's called red loot. Similar sort of mechanic. You're not getting ISK instantly. You have to salvage it or loot it and then get it to a point of selling. The, the thing about wormholes, which I actually like in, in, in gaming in general, I like making my ISK you do it a, an intense event that's harder to multi-box or, or kind of like half AFK. You make a lot of money, then you have a cooldown. You can't do it nonstop. You can't. It's not like mining where I can I can put an orca out and mine twenty hours a day, so that I can put five workers out or ten workers out, and that's how I scale. You, you do a, a highly lucrative event, and then you have a cooldown. And I like that as an option in terms of making ISK. My, my bigger problem with wormholes is how the respawns are being manipulated to speed that up and make it infinite. But the problem is that you're countering with a non sequitur, right? It, you, you're basically arguing something that has nothing to do with what I just said. Because when you're talking about bounties and ISK, right, then I completely agree. All bounties should be converted into some sort of blue loot that is a carryable and, and, and risked uh, asset that you have to then move to actually sell that's fair so you're but totally the point i was making with yeah. with wormholes is that the amount of of isk generation versus resource generation is a problem it needs to be only resources in wormhole space so to be clear you don't like bounties at all shooting rats and getting a bounty put into your bank account doesn't make any sense and i think what aria's point was is 
uh, the blue loot's a better mechanic and the red loot as well because you shoot something, it drops something, you grab it and you go turn it in. So you have an interception point where you might lose it if somebody destroys your ship while you're coming back from the killing fields, let's call it, to the yeah. market. And you're saying, and, and, and it should all be it should all be made into blue loot, and ideally it should actually rather be made into uh, valuable resources. drops, right? right? So so modules and uh, other things like the fact that uh, you, you should be farming them for resources instead of raw isk. Isk printing ideally should only come from mission running, um, because that reflects the fact that money is printed centrally by governments and then it becomes a mode of uh, communication to find prices. Uh, Nullsec should not have is printing. Uh, wormholes should not have is printing. It should only be done in high sec. And mm -hmm. then the way that they get ISK is by import exports. That's exactly how the game should have been. But it was almost like the, the ISK generation was like the training wheels because you had to have these things before the economy got up and running. Yeah, I also agree with that. Yeah, it's I, I do. it's I, hard to balance that now because I think ultimately getting rid of those ISK faucets where everything you get is a material that can be used by yourself or someone else to improve and make something else. It, I, I like that as an end goal, um, but then you always will have price swings and things will come in, in flavor and out of flavor and entire professions or different areas become profitable not. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That could spawn incentive for one group to move and take another group's space or territory. It's yeah. also because ideally I would like to see the point where say in null space, the nominal value or the price that is being put on something traded there is so different from elsewhere that you will actually start having meaningful trade again, right? So let's say that there's uh, a lot of easy availability of, say, uh, specific uh, types of, of drops or specific types of mineral in, say, Dell, right? But other things are completely impossible to source there, right? Then you would get start having imports, exports. You would have meaningful markets. Yeah, so Storm Rider Studio says, remove bounties, give everybody a rat tag, which they have to trade in empire space. And that's been floated a few times. Like, there is no straight cash. You got to turn in your receipts. Uh, um, there's horrible examples that I can't run into. But basically, yeah, you have to show evidence of, you know, like you have to bring a tail of a fox if you go fox hunting. And then they count the tails that you bring in, and that's what you get paid for. Um, but I think... The larger point is make everything in NullSec space a commodity that's traded. So its value is based on its need and it can go really high or really low. Um, but you have to create a demand for those things. Otherwise, you could stagnate and kill parts of uh, NullSec gameplay pretty easily. If there's no demand for something that your region is producing, you got nothing to do. It's all about, I know that it sounds like complexities that might not be necessary, but these complexities are, are pressure points that, that are potential points of failure. That means that, that everyone becomes more interdependent and, 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 and can't really sit there and go, oh, I'm just going to have my own corp with 100 alts, right? You, you have to trade or fight. There is n no out. If you're not doing that, you're not playing the game at all. Okay, but that in, that negates a game style that's been around for a long time, which is I want to harvest. I don't want to fight so much. I don't have enough guys to fight effectively, and I can't multi-client uh, uh, enough. So I'm just going to rent some space. Somebody else will provide the major security so I don't get evicted. Uh, I may get bugged by a few pirates here and there, but I'll take care of that. But I'm just going to rent space, and then I can play my harvesting game in relative peace. What do you think of that game style? Well, again, you can do that. You can, but, but the fact that you have, okay, many players don't know where stuff is sourced from, right? Many people play Eve and they have no idea how Morphite gets generated, right? Mm -hmm. they, 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 they buy it in Jita, right? That, that's pretty much it. And, and, and this is, again, back to you can play EVE in your own way and not know that everything else that you are basically trading uh, is sourced by another player. Um, 
many people still think that NPCs supply anything in Eve, and, and as far as I am aware, it's still mostly uh, blueprints, right? And skill yeah. books. Skill books. Everything blueprints. else is 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 created by another player. So you can still be oblivious to everything that goes on in Eve and the fact that Nolsec is at war and still sit there and play in your little sandbox. It's 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 not something that's off the table, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be interdependent and something that is well, if more you, meaningful. If you can create a solid demand for everything that can be brought in from Nullsec, then everything will have a baseline price. I would also say you have to eliminate ganking in high sec and leave those space lanes open to create... Um, well, I don't know if I would do that. Um, yeah. Oh, I, th I think high sec ganking is a massive topic and, and you know that yeah, I, I know. said... Um, before yeah. that, that to to welcome a, a bigger player base, it needs to somehow be rebalanced because currently the 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 well paper tiger that, uh, yeah. griefer attitude is just too dominant in Eve. Well, Does your I'm, count as gankers? I'm thinking in terms of you know what you need. You need, <laughs> you, you need NPC. You need NPC uh, hauling uh, as an option. Right. Players fill that gap. There's only two companies that are player made that will move stuff for you. But I think if you could basically say, I need to move this stuff over here, move this stuff over there. If you could do that with NPCs, I think uh, you would facilitate more demand for items. Uh, and then I think once you have a demand pool, then you could say, now we need a scarcity um, pool from NullSec. And now the things that NullSec has are valuable um, and have a market for them, and we'll always have a market for them. But um, I think, yeah, but I think everything has to have some kind of place to go. Otherwise, you could end up having territory that just sucks. Now, some territory might be better than others, but that's great. That's what causes wars. And it should change. Now, I don't want to jump on the war deck, war, war, um, war deck uh, topic. That's a whole topic that can, almost needs its own show. Um, I do want to go back a little bit to the resource. I do like the idea of, of like blue and red loot over bounties. Um, I think it would, right now when, when someone gets attacked they, and they're in a bounty system, they can leave. They don't lose anything. I can just run away and I made my money. So if, if Caleb's hunting me and warps in and I warp out, I go, nope, I'm not going to fight you, Caleb. I got all my isk. But if I had like a blue or red loot, Essentially, Kelly would say, wow, Rayer ran away, but he left his wallet on the table. I guess I'll have to be content with what he did. The yeah. last you should be able to cite. I'll take his money. You should be able to jettison cargo and say, look, I left my wallet. Leave me alone. I want to escape. Well, one of the things is to flip the, the um, uh, thing and base it on security status, right? So the payout of bounties should be uh, basically have security, real sex security status as a multiplier. So effectively you get almost nothing in, in null, but uh, player bounty should be the opposite, right? So you don't get anything when you gank someone in high sec, but when you gank them in, in, in null, you get the full payout, right? So, so you have a, a negative feedback uh, uh, yeah. system based on the player to player bounty and player to environment bounty. Yeah. And Jade Dog asked the question. It's not he says it's not right I have to take all the risk of my ship in null sec, then have to bring my loot all the way to high sec and all gankers have to do is sit on the bottleneck and destroy it. And this is where value added service comes in that Manuel talked about. You could do all that, or for a little bit less profit, I sell it to someone who is really good I bring it to a trade hub and selling it. And then I don't have to worry about that risk. And I've now created a profession for smuggler. someone that buys it's, it's you know, smuggler that buys the blue tags in null sec and brings it to a trade hub. And that's, that could be our entire profession is you're a smuggler. That was a profession. It used to be a thing to be a, there were smuggler routes that were known that were the better routes to travel through. Uh, and, and then if, if you've brought in something like limitations on uh, NPC industry, right? You would also have the fact that when you shoot someone in high sec, right? If they drop something that is T2 relevant, uh, take two relevant, it won't be able to be effectively value traded uh, in an NPC station. So you would need docking rights in a player structure. And then you start having the whole point of then politics and players uh, ACLs start being a lot more meaningful. Of course, you could always take it to TTT, which is completely neutral and open to everyone. 
But ideally, that would become the new Gita, and then you could end up being ganked again when you're trying to dock with the things that you got from player kills. So we need to get things more into the hands of players and less into uh, PvE and NPC stuff. I saw somebody saying earlier, this is uh, goons trying to create more goon swarm advantages in the game. What's your counter to that? Everything I've been talking about is potentially going to add pressure points to big empires so you actually have a way to uh, disrupt. disrupt their activities, right? Uh, everything that, that we've talked about will also hit them. Sure, in some sense, it might also benefit them, but it definitely creates new pressure points and new things to actually challenge. Because if you can stop their mining, if you can stop their industry, if you can uh, basically corner a market or manipulate the price finding, they have to source everything locally. And this is the, the mistake that CCP did. They gave all null entity and all null space the ability to source everything locally for themselves. They made what, what was called in, independent, right? The, the fact that they do not have to trade, they do not have to interact with any neighbors or any competitors. And that flattening of the game is what started the stagnation. We need the, 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 the differences back. In, in the old, old days, even something like mineral distribution was completely uh, based on space, right? There was a, a map showing what type of raw material was prevalent in what type of empire space. And this was just removed and flattened. Right. I agree that you need more pressure points that uh, smaller groups can use, because then you can have a multitude of smaller groups that can effectively push pressure points on a bigger empire. That seems to be a good thing. That's what Fazisov or uh, Aegisov is all about. Um, but the point is, the Imperium as a group, or just an entity like Imperium that's well organized, can also use those pressure points against small little villages around them, couldn't they? Well, as, yeah, as, I don't think this is part of the sob, though. I mean, this is, I mean, this idea of, of folks spreading out, it can be used against everyone, but that I think that that's an important thing that we're missing here. We have these big groups building big castles, and not only are we ramping up industry inside, which I think is makes sense, right? You're in an inner city where you have your factories, but resource gathering benefits the inner city. What game do you play that? The built-up city has the best resource gathering in a game. I, I can't think of an, any other game that's like that. Most games, you want to get resource gathering. You want the good stuff. You need to travel out into the dangerous areas of the, of the map to get those resources. We just don't have that right now. And this is what it used to be, right? Most Tritanium, as far as I remember, was mostly sourced by uh, high seconds, right? Uh, the low-end um, minerals were not primarily mined in Null. They were chasing all the rare stuff that was only exclusively available in Null. And this is the type of stuff we need back. We need these exclusive uh, things about geography. So, so Null is very different in the value created from, say, HiSec or wormhole space. And that creates the, the, the interdependencies of trade. That means that Heisek needs to export their titanium and basically convert it into morphite and cheap megaside and cycling. It, it's these things that used to work. And the fact that uh, goons and other null entities uh, lobbied for independence and, mm -hmm. and, and, and well, everything being sourced, yeah. Yeah, being sourced locally and the whole farms and fields. And farms and fields would be great if it was in a structure-based system where we had moon mining and moon mining was balanced in a way that is scalable and assailable where you can actually strategically attack it and it means something. But we didn't have that when these things were discussed. So we basically have to remake the game as it used to be, but with these new features and awesome fucking platforms. So, because structures and moon mining is amazing. So in two, it just needs a little bit of tweaking. Yeah, in 2013, there was uh, the end of Dominion Solve, which was uh, um, which was the second. It was actually the third iteration of of sovereignty. How you captured sovereignty and controlled space. The first one was moons, and you had to control the moons. The second one was controlling a system with certain structures, and uh, then came. It was basically solved. So um, CCP was on the verge of creating a new solve. And one of the things that, this is around 2014, uh, NullSec 
weighed in publicly and wrote a letter saying the saw this is the the null deal and it was basically uh, their idea of how uh, sovereignty should look and it should be occupancy based was one of their three components and it had sign on from nc dot and pl and other people as well but it was generally pushed by uh, the matani.com website and uh, the imperium so they themselves said uh, we want more occupancy solve. It's got to mean something to be in your space. And it's also uh, why, yeah, it's, it's kind of why many of the things that CTV have done have been a little bit upside down and actually, in my opinion, wrong. The, the, the thing with things like farms and fields, you want something like moon platforms to be able to actually generate mm, pyrite and tritanium, right? Uh, but at a, at, while sacrificing other things, right? So the slider needs to be, if you turn it one way, you get more moon-specific materials, right? So take two stuff. But if you turn it down, you can get a lot of T1 stuff. So you have this way of offsetting it, but you offset it by putting something in space that can be destroyed by another player. This is exactly what farms and fields means. You have a farm, it can be burned and raised. So they should put it back, uh, but they should put it back in a meaningful way. Yeah, that's basically you're by players doing something, they affect the territory they live in. That's the whole concept behind it. And I, I agree with that. You know, you live in space, it should mean something. It should affect the space in some ways. Now, I don't think it means bounties should go up. I, I, I kind of like the idea that um that Storm mentioned that if you over farm a region and you like farm the rats enough, they start moving away. You have to go to a a more dangerous region. Yeah, it That's really fine. doesn't make sense with how SOV upgrades work now that if you kill enough pirates, you can put something up that makes more pirates show up to where they all keep getting killed. Exactly. And this is why you I, kill I, them I, enough, they start giving you more money for killing them some more. I mean. Well, this is why I, I, I argue that what they should do is flip the ADMs, right? The, the, the way that ADMs should infect, uh, affect space is that it negatively affects the wildlife but positively affect your structures. So if you uh, have high ADMs, your uh, production speed or your yields and all of that stuff goes up, but it only affects the sovereignty holder. So you will have this thing where over farming will become a thing, but it's at a benefit to the structure and, and, and landowner, right? But uh, still, then, then it becomes a populated space where the wildlife is no longer available but all the infrastructure is of a high value instead, right? This is the type of, of seesaw, negative feedback type of dynamic that CCP needs to start looking at because everything that they've done historically is a little bit like just N plus one, just add one, add a tier, add a grade, add a, a new level. And when you do that, you get the destroyed ecosystem. You get this accretion and overabundance problem uh, and they need to flip that. All right, we are coming to an end here. I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have CCP on, and uh, we'll be talking about the new quadrant. So you want to tune in tomorrow at 1600. Uh, we'll be talking with CCP Rise, uh, Logic, I think that's his name, uh, Convict, and a few others. I mentioned them earlier. Let's see. Wow, are they blobbing you with like a whole army of devs? Yeah, so it'll be, yeah, CCP Rise, CCP Signal, CCP Oracle, and CCP Psych and Convict. So all four or five of those guys will be on with me tomorrow talking about the new stuff. They'll have some announcements. Um, I don't know what they're going to be. We can just say this. More information on ESS and command ship changes, as well as some reveals and new features and events that are coming soon. So they're going to do that tomorrow here on Talking In Stations at 1600. Oh, command ship change? The CC, it's the CC, CCP Pappy versus Talking In Stations tomorrow. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, some good stuff uh, from CCP. Check it out. We're going to uh, try to get as much out of them as we can. I didn't know there would be any command ship changes. Yeah, they were talked about earlier. All right. I wonder if that's the 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 torpedo idea they had, what three six months ago about anti capital torpedoes, and they're looking for a ship for it. Well, oh my god, we'll I find so out tomorrow. Want that the big bomb. I, 
Yeah. I would have expected that to be on a Tech 2 version of the Attack Battle Cruiser. <laughs> All right, well, we'll keep discussing online here. Join us on Talking Stations Discord. Uh, also, I forgot to say, Suetonia will be joining us for that show, too, uh, tomorrow. So we will see you tomorrow, 1600, uh, on Talking in Stations. Thanks, guys. We'll see you. We're going to go to Suetonia now. Starting up a raid.